In the corner of our Japanese garden here at our studio, we have a Japanese black pine. We planted it here where it kind of twists and curves its trunk around some of these rocks in this Japanese garden, which is pretty characteristic of the Japanese black pine. And there's one thing I want to show you today that uh, you can do to your pine trees to keep them a little bit more compact. You can see the candles. The, uh, the new elongating shoots of the pine come out on the, uh, the tips of the branches in the springtime. And if we break these off, break this long one off here, just kind of pop it off there. And that will give some of these other buds the same opportunity to, to grow. So instead of having just one long branch, we'll have four branches. So it kind of helps thicken up the pine. Now we'll come back a little bit later and selectively prune out some of these limbs to give it a more picturesque look. And it is important to break the candles rather than cutting them with pruners because when you cut them with the pruners you can end up cutting a lot of the needles and that will give them a brown look throughout the season. Of course these have a little bit of brown on them now because of the freeze we had back around Easter. Well, you may remember earlier this spring, we were out here in the Japanese garden and we were talking about this plant. This is one of the sweet flags and the botanical name is a chorus. And back when we were talking about this plant, we were looking at monkey grass and some of the other early spring flowering perennials and grass-like plants and talking about how if we cut those back, it will give us all fresh shoots or leaf shoots and just make the plant look a lot better throughout the year. And I was talking about how this plant looks like a grass or a sedge or maybe something in the iris family, but it's actually in the same family with elephant ears, the Eraceae. And today we're going to prove it. And that's because the acorus or the sweet flag here is flowering. And this is what the flowering structure looks like. This little fleshy stem here is just covered with lots of little flowers and this structure is known as a spadix and that is characteristic of plants in the arum family or the Araceae. and I do have several plants in the Araceae that I'd like to show you today it is a pretty large family a lot of members of this family occur in the tropical parts of the world. A lot of our very famous house plants are in the Arum family. And one of the names given to groups of plants in this family is aeroids. So a plant in the Arum family is sometimes referred to as an aeroid, which I've kind of wondered why the daisies, which are in the aster family, aren't called asteroids, or maybe some of the, the nightshades in the uh, Solanaceae or the Solanum family aren't called solenoids. But uh, anyway, the aeroids are what we call plants in the Araceae. Well, we've talked about this aeroid on our show in the past. This is Italian arum, a beautiful perennial for the shaded garden. Just look at the pattern there in the, uh, the leaf. Now, it does have sort of a characteristic somewhat elephant ear type foliage, a little bit different than the uh, sweet flag over there, but uh, it's in flower right now. And I'll just reach down and snap this flower off so you can kind of see it. But uh, look at that, isn't that impressive? This is the flower structure here in the center. This is the spadix. And the, it looks like just a solid sort of dome right now, but those uh, little flowers are sort of inside this. It's almost like a, like a, like a big bud structure. This will start to separate into uh, uh, just dozens of little flowers. This structure is called the spathe. And you may be familiar with some of our house plants like the aglianemas or the, uh, the peace flags that uh, also have this structure. But typically, plants in the, the Araceae have, have a spathe and a spadix associated with the flowering structure. And uh, if you look closely at the, uh, the, uh, the little acorus here, you can see that uh, it does closely resemble that flower. Well, over here on uh, another part of our garden, we have some other plants 
in this same family. They're not in bloom right now, but I think you will recognize this plant. This is a calla lily. And the spathe, that big sheath part of the flower structure, is, is very showy whenever it comes out on the calla lily. These are plants native to parts of Africa that uh, we can grow in our, our gardens here in Oklahoma. These are actually hardy to zone seven, so gardeners in the southern part of Oklahoma can overwinter these quite well. I have seen them overwinter in protected spots as far north here as Stillwater, but uh, you can see the, uh, the photo down here. This is the white giant calla lily, and that spathe is very attractive. It has a, uh, a large white spathe on the calla lily that gives us a lot of color in the garden. Calla lilies really like the moist parts of our garden, but we can get other colors of calla lilies. We can get yellow ones, we can get pink ones, and there's some that are very dark, almost black. Now you can purchase these already planted in containers like this, but uh, sometimes you can actually buy the little tuber of the calla lily, or you can order those from maybe some bulb catalogs as well and plant those in the garden. Well, as I mentioned, a lot of our house plants are in the arum family, and this is a very popular one right here. This is a philodendron, and the philodendron group of plants are quite varied as well. They have lots of different shapes of leaves. There are some that are vines, there are some that are trees, uh, some that are more shrub-like, more tropical perennial-like. This is what I sometimes call a saddle leaf philodendron. You may be able to kind of picture uh, maybe somewhat the shape of a saddle by looking at the uh, the leaf there, but uh, very attractive. I love just those those, those fingers or those those uh, those lobes of this philodendron. This is also sometimes known as the tree philodendron because it does develop a woody trunk. Well, a couple of other plants in the arum family that we want to take a look at are the elephant ears and caladiums. Caladiums and elephant ears are very attractive plants for the summer landscape. They give us sort of a tropical look to our gardens. And when it comes to elephant ears, we've got these tropical plants with the really huge leaves that look like the ears of an elephant that grow from a corm. It's actually a corm attached to a large tuber but uh, for general purposes, we usually just call them bulbs. But uh, this large bulb part would be considered the tuber, and these little offshoots are known as the corms. And that's where uh, new plantlets will arise on the elephant ear. Now, there are a number of plants that are called elephant ears. There's several different genera, but again, pretty much all in the arum family. And out here at our studio garden, we've grown several different types of these through the years. A couple years ago, we had an Asian food garden, and we had one type of elephant ear in there, and we talked about how this is a plant used by about 10% of the world's population as a good food item. Well, I have people write in from time to time on the program, and they talk about how they save their elephant ear bulbs from year to year, and when they plant them out in the spring, they're a little bit smaller than what they started out with. And that's because each year when you plant this, this big bulb in the ground, the original bulb will rot away, and either new corms or a totally new tuber will be produced on top of the plant. So if you start out with a really big bulb, we don't have a long enough growing season in Oklahoma for that bulb to get as big as the one you, you usually start with. So you can keep them from year to year, but uh, they will get smaller and not quite as large as the, uh, the bulb you start with. And it's interesting, the roots that develop on the elephant ear bulb, they're known as contractile roots, and those will, those will sprout out here kind of along the base, and they will kind of pull that new bulb down to the same level. So each year, a new bulb will form up here on the top, and the roots from it will keep pulling it down into the soil. So that's how the plant kind of stays where it is in the soil. Now, you could buy an elephant ear bulb like this and have a pretty good size, huge, leave tropical plant in your garden, or you could spend a little bit more money and get something like this. 
Again, these are both elephant ear bulbs. Now you're going to spend a little bit more for this, but uh, this was grown in a either a tropical or subtropical part of the world, and you're really going to get some large leaves if you plant this elephant ear bulb. And again, you won't be able to have a bulb as large as this one to dig up in the fall because it will produce another little bulb on top by the end of the growing season. But elephant ears are great additions to our garden to give us that tropical look. Well, closely related to elephant ears are the caladiums. And there are a number of ways you can purchase caladiums. You can purchase them already planted in a pot like this one, or you could also purchase the caladium tubers. And you can uh, dig these up and store them through the winter and keep the same caladiums year after year. Now, one thing that uh, you need to know about caladiums is that there's a trick to getting them to produce a lot more leaves. Now, this one looks a little bit sparse. There's probably two or three caladium bulbs in this pot, and you're definitely going to pay a lot more if you buy the potted up tubers in the, uh, in the garden center. But one way to get a lot more leaves from your caladium tubers is known as scarring out the buds or the eyes. Now, we can figure out which end is up. You can tell this is the, uh, the bottom of the caladium tuber and up here we got this this big bud where uh, a big leaf will come out in the center but we've also got these these little buds around the side as well and what we're going to do is treat this sort of like a, a coleus that we would pinch back to get it to branch out more we're going to take out the buds we're going to scar out the leaf buds of our caladium tuber See where I, I just took that one out? Just everywhere there's a little bump, you're just going to make a little crater. Not only get the big one, but uh, these bumps on the side here. Again, just take a little paring knife and just everywhere there's a bump, we're just going to go around and just make a little divot or a little crater. And what this is going to cause is all the little hidden leaf buds that aren't up to the surface, it's going to cause all of those to sprout and you can get easily six to seven times as many leaves from your caladium tubers just by scarring out all those little buds. Now right over here we've got one that uh, we worked on a couple days ago and after you, after you do this you, you do kind of open up the tuber to uh, some, some, some problems, some rots and things like that. So you want to set it aside and let it kind of dry out, let it kind of suberize like, like this one's done. See, it's kind of toughened up a little bit. So for at least three or four days, just let it kind of dry out a little bit and then it's ready to plant like this one. And you'll get a lot more leaves from your caladiums. Now, whenever you plant caladiums outside in Oklahoma, I recommend doing it after about the uh, first to second week of May, and that's because caladiums, and this goes for the elephant ears as well, are tropical plants. And sometimes we have them rot if we plant them too early. If you plant them early to mid-April, the soils are wet, they're, they're, they're really cold, they haven't really warmed up yet, and uh, those, those caladium and elephant ear bulbs alike will rot sometimes. So again, wait till about the, uh, the first or second week of May before you plant those out. And uh, you should have a really good tropical foliage display in your garden.